Hey everybody, this is Lady B from NYC here for Local Lore. That's my new channel where the legends of yesterday are appreciated and the legends of tomorrow are created. So with that being said, we are going to go to the first aspect of Local Lore. And that is the legends of yesterday being appreciated. Now, today is going to be a very, very special first edition. And that is because someone very special is coming. And I'm going to give you guys a hint. He is, well, was a member of Buck Cherry. And he was one of of the two founding members of the band, songwriter, producer, badass guitarist, what's his name? Keith Nelson. Yes, Keith Nelson. You heard right. Little old me from Brooklyn, New York is going to be interviewing Keith Nelson. Oh my God, such a wonderful thing to happen to me during this quarantine. And by the way, anybody who is in quarantine and you're not feeling good, I send out wonderful, healthy vibes, get better. We need people to get better from this. We do. Thank God my daughter is and everyone else in the, in the family pretty much is. So we are going to have a great show. Keith has been doing, from what I've seen on his Instagram, he's actually been doing a lot. He is in the middle of producing an album right now, so we are going to be discussing that, along with a few other things. And before we get that underway, I am going to be letting you guys know that with this channel, it's going to pretty much be shining the light on bands that are not very well known or you know just trying to keep the music alive <laughs> trying to keep the music alive because let's face it this pandemic it's if i didn't know any better it was a, it's pretty much repeating around the time of when you know we lost richie valens buddy holly big bopper the day the music died and right now venues as we know it you know they're hanging on by a thread so you know we need to make sure that these places do not go under because once this thing calms down then it's going to pick back up again so that's another thing also we're going to be discussing with keith uh in a little bit um but yeah, like some of these places I've seen on Instagram, like, you know, Bowery Electric, um, Arlene's Grocery, you know, these places, they have uh, a Patreon page or, you know, a GoFundMe page where, you know, you can buy stuff from their from their merchandise store or you can donate whatever it is that you would want to donate. They're still, God bless them, they're still doing performances. Of course, no one can actually go into the building, but they're doing stuff live via stream. So kudos to you guys for doing what you can to stay alive. I really applaud you for that. And you guys, you have my love. You have my love. So to get started, actually, I'm going to give you guys a little taste of something that a friend of mine actually did a while back. Um, most of you know, if you guys know me and know my show, The Diva Lounge, when I was uh, when I had it on uh, Spreaker and also on a few other uh, web radio panels on platforms, I am very good friends with a few people from The Voice and one of them who lives in Vegas, my boy Ryan White Maloney, yes, I'm shouting you out, boy. Um, he has been doing a lot of collaborations with a lot of different bands from all over the place. I'm very proud of him. He's been getting his songs played in places like Australia and that's awesome. 
he did this song, Michael, featuring a band named Kodab. And I really think you guys would enjoy it. So we are going to have a little bit of this tune here for you guys. And then after the interview with Keith, I'm going to be featuring another uh, band from another state. Okay? So stay tuned. Everybody say hello to Keith Nelson right here. Your studio is looking amazing. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a good place to, it's a good place to work. It's like, uh, you know, some people go to church and some people go to hockey games and I go to the studio. <laughs> you know what? A amen. Honestly, if I could, if I could have like my own little setup like that, believe me, I would. I'm, I'm in the basement apartment now. Um, I had to come upstairs because there's more, just more room up right. here. Better lighting. Uh, are you in New York, New Jersey? Where are you at? New York. All right. Or as I, I would like to put it, um, black down in Brooklyn. There you go. <laughs> you in Brooklyn? Yep. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? That, uh, that song, I swear to God, when I bought 15 and I saw that you guys had a song called Brooklyn. I'm like, oh my God, I have to listen to this. I mean, I already knew Crazy Bitch was a, was one of my favorites, but wow. then I was like, oh my God, they're paying tribute to my neighborhood. That's wonderful. I mean, you know, we've, um, historically, that band has had a really good history with a lot of friends in Brooklyn. And, um, you know, I'm uh, I'm pretty close with, and Xavier is pretty close with the guys at Indian Larry Motorcycles. 
Ah. Uh -huh. They're Brooklyn based handmade man, uh, motorcycle manufacturer. So, you know, we have ties there. I think that uh, Josh wrote those lyrics about a, an actual experience that he had there. Some of those lyrics are, you know, <laughs> based on autobiographical stuff. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good song. It's unbelievable. And you know what? It's funny. That was my first time ever seeing you guys live. It was at Irving Plaza for that uh, release for that album. Yeah. It was amazing. And I think that was the one time that my friend and I were like amazingly happy that we were not 21 yet because the line got longer. We were there way before people even started lining up. And it got longer, of course, as, as we waited, because we had something to eat beforehand. And we get inside, every, practically everyone that was in front of us on the line went to the bar first. So we wound up getting right behind these two girls that were right behind the barricade. So, so you were one of those girls that was uh, on the sidewalk at 2.30 in the afternoon waiting to get in. Pretty much. Yeah. All right. Pretty much. You're right on. So, so, so you're a bona fide rock and roll fan. Oh, of course. That's it's. <laughs> you want to know a hilarious thing about that night? My friend and I, we were getting, we were trying to figure out what to eat, right? And these two guys that we see bringing stuff off of the off, off of your guys' bus, we didn't know if it was your bus or not, right. but we thought they worked for the venue, and that wasn't the case. It turned out that it was your drum tech, T-Bone, and one other guy. And we had no idea that they worked for you guys until after. And we're like, no way. <laughs> this is crazy. Good guys. Very good guys. Very good guys. And that's actually how me and my friend got to meet you guys after the show. I mean, Xavier. Xavier pretty much hogged me because we <laughs> oh my goodness this is crazy um there's a knock at my door hold on one moment I'm so sorry right. I, I distinctly told people not to disturb me one moment I'm so so pretty much you know what I want to what I do want to discuss with you is um you know, you've been departed from, from Bug Cherry for a while. And, you know, I just wanted to get an insight as to, you know, was that a mutual decision or was it more of a personal thing? Um, I mean, you know, Bianca, I haven't really spoken much about that because I didn't really want to draw a ton of attention to it. Um, I definitely made the decision to, to leave and for me, it was just the right decision on many different levels. You know, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a personal thing because I don't uh, have any personal gripe against anyone that uh, mm -hmm. band. It was, you know, just at where I was um, in my life as an artist and as a father and as a, you know, just as a human, it was time for yeah. me to do something. So that's, that's why I made the decision to do that. That's uh, honestly, that's a very respectable reason. That is a very respectable reason, because I mean, as an artist, I mean, I've, I'm not a musician myself, but I have known a lot of them. And when it comes down to it, you know, things like that, you have to take into account as, you know, the time goes on, you know, is this still what I want? Is this still what oh, I want to do? Making music, being creative, being a rock and roller, doing that, I mean, that's what I do. It's what I love to do. That's what I'm continuing to do. Um, just the circumstances of life change. I think that, you know, um, when I left the band, I was in my late forties. When I started that band with Josh, I was in my mid twenties. And oh, yeah. I think the things that you want in your mid twenties are different than the things that you want 20 years later. Uh, at least for me, they were, um, yeah. as far as some of the details and some of the, um, um, the subtleties of, of, you know, what goes into making up your life and what makes you happy. And um, I'm so proud of the work I did with that band. Um, oh, so am I. <laughs> creating something from nothing, you know, it was just an idea that he and I had. We both worked day jobs and um, we had to overcome a lot of obstacles. And uh, so I'm super proud of it. And, and um, 
it's just time for me to do something different and that's what I'm doing now. And I think that they're happy. I know I certainly am. And there's no ill will and it's all good for me at least. That, that you know what? That's, that's really what matters. That's really what matters. I hate hearing, you know, about individuals that, you know, they wind up having a fallen out and it's just, it's a bitter time. And, you know, people are at each other's throats. They just don't want to deal with it. But the fact that, you know, you have this, it was a, what they would call, I guess, a harmonious departure. Um, I can only speak to my side of it. Um, my reasons for leaving weren't from a negative thing whatsoever. It wasn't like, fuck you, I'm out of here. It was like, I, I want to do something else. Yeah. And that's my end of it. And that's all I can really speak to. No, absolutely. I can, uh, I can definitely agree with that. Um, now with the pandemic that's, you know, hit, hit all of us, how has it been adapting to that? Because I know that venues have been like literally hanging on by a thread. A lot of these places, it's like, they're really struggling. Artists are struggling. How are you coping with it? Well, um, okay. So I stopped touring in 2017 is when I left the band. So from 2017 on, I haven't really relied on being a touring musician to support myself. Um, I, I have been fortunate enough to segue my career into producing and songwriting for other artists. So by the time the pandemic hit, I was kind of in a flow of work. Now the pandemic did slow some of that because for the first six months, I didn't do anything in person. I did it all via Zoom. But that said, I was able to really um, be creative and keep working and writing with people and getting songs on records and 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 doing things in that world. So um, I think the pandemic has hit uh, touring musicians the hardest. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying I'm not unaf uh, unaffected by it because I certainly have been. But it's starting to pick up now, you know, like we're doing sessions where we have strict COVID protocols, um, we're masked up, we're taking COVID tests, we're doing temperature checks. Um, I'm in the middle of making a record right now where we have weekly checks and um, temperature checks every day when, when people come to the studio. We're maintaining social distancing and we're able to work. So uh, luckily, although we've, I've personally felt it, I've been able to work around it a little bit and stay creative and be able to uh, continue to do this for a living. Very cool. Very cool. I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that because, I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, knowing musicians, especially the, well, some of my closest friends, pretty much they've all told me, you know, idle hands are the devil's playground. I need something to do. And a lot of them have come across, you know, doing live streams on YouTube or on, you know, the in, on their Instagram or on their Facebook. Yeah. A friend of mine, uh, you know, he actually does uh, Facebook lives of his gigs, yeah. which wherever he can get them, which is always good. Um, there's a few venues that I know of that are still, you know, they're still operational in a way, but what they're doing is they're still having bands coming to their location and they just host a live streaming from there so it's really no like live audience within the building it's just the individuals operating you know whatever needs to get done in order to do the stream and you know like two of these places that i know of are the bowery electric and uh, arlene's grocery oh yeah yeah well, you know, I think I think what the pandemic is showing a lot of people is it's kind of shaken up how we look at this entire business, especially from the live live business. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that we're it's, it's forcing everyone to get really, really creative um, and figure out other ways to kind of get music to people without being there in person. Um, yeah, I, I'm just really grateful that it looks like we have Hopefully we've uh, crossed over the other side of the peak of that mountain and we're on the downhill side and things are headed towards more normalcy. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely.
and you know when it comes down to it, I just I, I'm I personally miss that personal touch. Yeah. I miss having to you know go to a show and you know mixing it up with people. I miss all of that like you wouldn't believe. And yeah, whatever. That's an energy I don't think that you can replicate any other way. You know, being there in a room, being on stage is it's a special it's a special thing. That's why you know playing to people's cell phones and actually having people hold iPads up while you're performing. I understand why people want to do that, but yeah. To me that was always and continues to be a really waste of a moment, you know. There's something about being in that moment and just being there in that moment and having that experience. My favorite concerts I ever saw were pre, you know, cell phone. And uh, <laughs> you know, if somebody was recording it, it was with a cassette recorder they smuggled <laughs> into the gig or some sort of video camera. Um, oh my God. And I and I have the best memories of of those shows and. To, to watch to, to be doing a show and watching somebody watch their phone while they're while they're it'd be like if we did this interview like this yeah exactly I'm like that the whole time and yeah. i'm not having a moment with you so um, yeah. it, it's it's weird it's odd. It, it, i mean it, it is um Again, you know, I, I understand why some people would want to do that. Like, if God forbid, you know, like, you know, a friend of yours is supposed to go with you to a show, let's say, and all of a sudden they can't make it, but they have, you know, your Facebook page or your Instagram page, and then you do a live and it's like, I'm technically still there with, I'm with you. But again, like you said, it takes away from actually being present in that moment with everyone like i i went to see slipknot i actually took my daughter with my sister and her husband to take my daughter to her first slipknot concert a couple of years ago and it was in jones beach and we made it very clear the only the only time that we were going to be taking out our phones is if we were going to take a picture with each other yeah. and that's it. We're going to enjoy the rule. show. That's a good rule. We're going to just enjoy the show and that's yeah. it. And she loved it. She absolutely loved it. And th things like that, those are moments that you just can't get back. Yeah. Es especially if you're going to see a band when then all of a sudden you know, they have a complete fallout. They're never going to play together ever again. Then what happens? You only have, I mean, granted, yeah, you might have video from that show, but it's different when you're not having any technology in your hands and it's just you there. Yeah. Well, hey, if Guns N' Roses has showed us anything, don't ever say never. That, man, that was oh. actually going to be one of my other questions. If the guys were to approach you and ask you, would you want to do a reunion thing, would you do it? Um, I haven't turned my phone off in 21 years since my daughter was born. <laughs> and I am not afraid to answer my phone. That's, And I'll leave the rest to that. Okay. Please, let's, let's pray. Send out right. the vibes. I I can pretty much guarantee you it's not going to ring, but you know, <laughs> I, I would never it, 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 like, like, like we said, not to go too backwards, but yeah, that wasn't yeah. my changing my path. Wasn't based on a negative thing. For yeah. me. No, of course. It wasn't, wasn't about any person in particular. It was about circumstances of life and, and creatively what I wanted to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, when it comes down to it, what, what are you working on right now? Okay, so um, the last thing, right now I'm in the middle of making a record with a band from New Jersey called Palisades. Nice. Um, we're, about, we're just about ready to finish that up. I'm starting another record in about 10 days with an artist. I don't like to talk about stuff that, you know, I, I'm more, my philosophy on it is really i'll let the work speak for itself so i'm a horrible yes. self-promoter um, i have a record coming up with a uh with an americana artist in about two weeks 
Very uh, cool. So Very cool. We cut this record with um, Palisade, which is a heavy, active rock band. Um, younger guys, more modern. Um, lots of writing sessions. Um, you know, the Ricky Warwick record's out this year that I uh, co-wrote with Ricky and played the guitar on and produced. Um, Ricky from Black Star Riders and Thin Lizzy. Very right. proud of that. So uh, if you haven't checked that out, check it out. So it's a really, really great record. But I Dave, definitely will. Xavier from uh, Black Cherry played drums on it for me. Yeah, um, my boy. <laughs> and, um, I, I did a lot of work with a, a guy called Tuck Smith, who was in a band called Biters. Um, okay. And I wrote a bunch of stuff with him on his solo record, which has not been released yet. Um, I'm also working, I've also worked with this young band from LA called Classless Act, which is on Better Noise Records, and they're going to put their record out. They just finished it. I have four songs on that record. Um, so that's kind of the, some of the stuff I've been up to. Wow. Very amazing. The so work I, never... a, um, I, I co wrote a song with Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke on their new record, uh, You Hear Georgia. That's coming out, I think, next month. Um, yeah. So I'm just staying really busy working with, working on all kinds of stuff. It's not really. Um, anything with a guitar and some drums and a singer, it's kind of where I'm at. Nice. Yeah. That, that is, you know what? I couldn't ask for anything more from you because that is amazing. I'm so glad for you. I'm very proud of you. Oh, thanks. And, you know, when, it, when you think about, you know, where music has has gone like okay one thing that i do want to cover um is that most people since the pandemic started and everything especially amongst artists um they see what what is doing you know to the venues and things like that a lot of people are actually thinking that once the pandemic is over it's you're gonna see venues either like re reinventing themselves or you're going to wind up seeing new ones pop up. What are your what are your thoughts on that with regards to the possibility of you know the scene making like a complete 180? Huh. Well, like I said, I think it's um the pandemic has forced everyone to kind of rethink their approach to a lot of things. I think the rise of, uh, the, of the streaming, uh, the virtual concerts with uh, companies like Veeps and these other companies that are doing it, I think it's really, really cool. It's really giving, it has the, op it has the chance of reaching a much wider fan base. Um, so I really like where that's going, especially because the quality is so good. Um, I personally love to go see an artist, but quite honestly, with a family and projects going on, I can't always go see. The last concert I saw was the Black Crows reunion at the Troubadour. Oh, wow. Pretty awesome, right before the pandemic. Um, oh, nice. But, but you know, I mean, um, I think it's, it's causing everyone to rethink a lot of different things. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these venues have closed because they couldn't afford to stay open. Um, yeah. So it won't surprise me to see new ones pop up, but it's a risky business. It's going to change the way <coughs> deals for the artists are structured because the old days of the big guarantee and then the promoter hoping he makes his money back, probably going to go by the wayside, at least for anyone that isn't a A plus tier artist like, you know, the Foo Fighters and, and Aerosmith and Slipknot, bands that fall underneath that we'll call them the middle class if you will and and sea level bands that are playing in clubs i think it's going to change the nature of the way the deals are done yeah no de definitely i mean especially when it comes down to the fact that you know you have I mean, back back then you know in uh, well i guess you could say in the earlier days a lot of these uh, artists and bands that would play a venue, a lot of the times it's pretty much you got paid based on how many people came to see you. And like, I noticed that with the Bowery Electric, like you would buy a ticket for a particular night and it's like, they do a tally as to, you know, okay, who did you come to see? And then they would like put a notch down right. on, each, on each act. Yeah. 
and Tur then. national touring acts it's a little bit different than that um but so what you're talking about is like the standard door deal which is you make the door however many people come through to see you that reflects uh your compensation for the evening your financial compensation so yeah um, it wouldn't surprise me if it devolves into more of that kind of model at least in the interim because who knows you know um, I, I know yeah. uh, my friend tuck smith just went and played a, a show in his first show in a year in nashville last week and he said it was an odd experience to actually be around people um, <laughs> but you know i, I do believe it's going to come back I, I don't think there's any I think rock and roll is alive and well. And um, and I think there's there's obviously there's a fan base for it. And I'm really looking forward to it getting back on its feet and um, oh, yeah. getting all these people working again. And uh, because all these people have families, you know, so it's just it's bigger than rock stars making money. It's people supporting themselves. The bus oh, yeah. driver, you know, the, the merchandise people, the people that work at the venues, uh, all those people. Oh, yeah. And we need rock to stay alive because let's face it, what's out there right now, I, I want to take holy water to some of these individuals and be oh, like, how dare you? I'm not going to get started on, on the quality of, uh, of, of popular music I, because it's a, no. it's a, it's an all it's, I think in every, in every era, people have complained about what's popular. You know, people were complaining about David Bowie. What's he doing? And we don't complain about that now. People saw Jimi Hendrix and thought, what is that guy doing? So I think it's evolving. I think, um, you know, as long as artists are staying true to themselves and um, inspiring people with their work, I don't see any problem in any of it. People will always have opinions and tastes and it's just yeah. the way it goes. Yeah. I mean, I that, people, is, that is true. People saw, people saw Buck Cherry in 1994. 697 when we were sparrow and they were laughing at us like what are these guys doing playing rock <laughs> we didn't fucking care we just did what we did my my advice to them would just be listen shut up and listen to him play <laughs> uh, well, hey you know um there's a lid for every pot as they say so <laughs> that is true that is very true my dear it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you Thank you so much. And good luck with your podcast. I hope you hit lots of subscribers. You make lots of money. Send some, <laughs> post some selfies of you on your yacht. <laughs> hey, I don't know about you know a yacht. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for keeping uh, the spirit of rock and roll alive and for, for giving people with, uh, for giving artists a chance to talk and tell their story. And um, you hit me up anytime. I'll be glad to talk to you. Oh, thank you. You take care of yourself. Continue doing well. Give all my best to the family. And also, the next time you talk to Xavier, please let him know that I said hi. I talked to him this morning. <laughs> oh. Just got back from Daytona Bike Week. He's doing really well with it. Uh, he's playing drums. He's doing some gigs. And he's also building fantastic motorcycles. I've seen that. I'm yeah. very proud of him with that. And he's probably the next, he's going to be the next one that I'm going to be having on here to talk about that because I'm also very interested in motorcycles. Yeah, hit him up. Tell him, tell him that you're heading on the pot. Well, I'll tell him. <laughs> All right, my dear. You have Thank a you. great day. Take care. And I'll definitely talk to you soon. Stay safe over there. You too. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much for the interview. It was really amazing. And I look forward to the next time to have you on the Galore Group. So, to close out this broadcast, it is going to be another uh, video with another song. And it's going to be from New York Locals, Dry Clean Only. And this is their tune, When I'm At My Worst. So I hope you guys enjoy it and stay tuned for the next episodes to come. Well, yeah, you know that I want to be an honest man and I want to trust myself again. Although you won't believe I can. And I, you know that I'm so ashamed of all that I've done, and I'm hanging out in 
Scatty little child, he ran circles for a while with dirty fingernails and scabby knees. You know that I just can't remember, only as your veins from embers that burnt out about three years or so ago. And that's a little child. 